All right, welcome to another Daily Devotions. It is December 4th, and we are beginning 2 Corinthians today, chapters 1 through 4. Let me read from the introduction to the Wesley Study Bible. Paul's first letter to Corinth reveals a lively church, but one weakened by internal divisions and compromised by the prevailing culture of the city. Some 18 months later, probably in 56 or 57 AD, Paul writes to them again. <clears throat> Second Corinthians is Paul's most personal letter or letters. The tone of chapters 10 through 13 is so different from chapters one through nine that some think these chapters which were originally written later. Second Corinthians is personal because Paul, between the writing of first and second Corinthians, had experienced a painful, humiliating visit to Corinth uh, that we will read about in chapter 2, 1 through 11. <clears throat> Soon after that, other Christians critical of Paul came to Corinth and cast doubts on his credentials as an apostle. Wesley writes, John Wesley writes, that whereas in 1 Corinthians, Paul had written mainly about the affairs of the Corinthians, in this he writes chiefly concerning his own, but in such a manner as to direct all he mentions of himself to their spiritual prophet. Paul is clear that the messengers of the gospel do not proclaim themselves, yet their lives are inseparable from their message. Paul preached the cross, and as this letter shows so powerfully, he lived it too. All right, so um, so the letter opens uh, by announcing the identity of the senders uh, and then listed their addresses. Corinth was capital of the Roman province of Achaia, uh, and it, which constituted much of Greece, at least 40 settlements around Corinth itself. A prosperous Roman colony in Greece, Corinth housed Roman citizens, Greek residents, and settlers from abroad. Uh, grace, the Greek word charis, sounded like the traditional Greek greeting charine, and peace was the standard Jewish greeting. Uh, such phrases were equivalent to God bless you, invoked a deity for blessing, for example. Uh, peace would, in, of course, conjures up the Jewish idea of shalom. The blessing of praise that Paul then uses follows a traditional Jewish form, uh, and uh, uh, Paul praises God for comforting him and his co-workers in the face of suffering, including potentially, deadly, potential, potentially deadly perils in Ephesus. These sufferings uh, and God's help become a theme running through most of 2 Corinthians, distinguishing Paul from his opponents. Paul also appeals to and reiterates the intimate relationship he has with the Corinthian believers. <clears throat> now, various kinds of works in antiquity began with narratives summarizing the events that led to the work's writing. Uh, but before Paul dares to confront the major issues with the false teachers that he's going to write against, he must clear up a misunderstanding. The church was disappointed with Paul's failure to follow through on his visit when they hoped to show him hospitality. Greco-Roman culture despised fickleness and unreliability, so Paul reiterates his integrity, which may serve as a thesis statement for at least this part of the letter. He emphasizes his transparency and later his sincerity and frankness. He and the Corinthians may affectionately boast in each other Paul's change of travel plans reflected no fickleness on his part. Now, to some of Paul crit Paul's critics who suspected his dishonesty, Paul's change of plans reflected a more fundamental character flaw than a mere scheduled conflict. If they could not trust Paul's promise to visit, why should they trust his apostolic message? Some probably also uh, suspected Paul's motives regarding the collection, even as time to provide it was coming due. Paul thus replies that his ministry is grounded in a God who is trustworthy regarding his promises. God confirmed that integrity by advancing them, the spirit as the down payment of future blessings. Paul explains that the real reason he has delayed coming to Corinth was to spare them. Paul did not want to have uh, did not want to have to discipline them, 
and uh, confronted them in a letter first to test their obedience. His failure to carry through on promised threats to come administer discipline would lead some of his critics to mock him for meekly confronting them by letters rather than in person. And so Paul sends this tearful letter, as he says, with Titus, uh, hoping to provoke them to repentance before his coming, lest he have to inflict discipline. Until Titus returned to him, however, shortly before the letter that he is writing, uh, 2 Corinthians, Paul did not know the Corinthian response. With Titus's return, Paul discovered that the Corinthians had repented, obeying his tearful letter. <clears throat> the church had complied uh, with his demand that they discipline the sin among them. Consequently, the man needing punishment had come to repentance, and they could now offer him forgiveness. Putting someone to the test was sometimes uh, a sign of affection. What is most obvious here, as throughout 2 Corinthians, is Paul's pastoral affection for the Corinthian Christians. Um, in chapter 2, starting in verse 12, Paul deals with some anxiety over Titus. Ancient travel was precarious, and individuals hoping to rendezvous sometime missed each other. Although Paul had much success in Troas, which was in northern Asia Minor, northern Turkey, he feared how the Corinthians had responded to his letters since Titus, whom he had sent them, had not returned. And so Paul, Paul crossed the Aegean into Macedonia, hoping to meet Titus on his way to Corinth. All right, now Paul, in, starting in 214, um, digresses from what he has been saying. Um, and uh, ancient speakers and writers sometimes did this. They digressed at length in order to build suspense and to make a point. Um, Paul is making uh, this kind of a rhetorical move. Uh, he's breaking off at the height of suspense and his love for the Corinthians to begin his digression about his apostolic ministry. Uh, being led as captives in triumphal procession is not an image of honor. To the captives, they were executed afterward. Paul portrays himself as one bound for death, like the crucified Jesus. To those without faith, such a state signified only death, but those with faith found life in it. Paul develops the theme further afterwards. Uh, the mere letter brings death, but the spirit brings life, Paul says. True perceptions matter. God's servants appear. Uh, to be dying on the outside, but in reality, they have eternal life. God's servants' sufferings confirm their sincerity, contrasting them with those who simply do ministry for profit, perhaps a backhanded warning against the oppressors. Now, starting in chapter three, Paul wants to discuss the glory of the greater covenant. Influential people who often wrote recommendation letters to ask favors on behalf of those who depended on the writers. Um, and this is what uh, we may see here. Uh, Paul rejects the need for formal letters of recommendation, but he's forced at times to recommend himself again to the Corinthians, uh, reminding them of what they already know for themselves. Self-boasting was considered inappropriate unless people were forced to do it, as Paul felt he was by them. Instead, the Corinthians' own faith constituted Christ's recommendation of Paul and his colleagues. People sometimes spoke of laws written on the hearts, and we see this in the Old Testament. Um, Ezekiel promised that God's, uh, the, the hearts of God's people would no longer be stony, uh, instead, God's spirit, uh, spirit would make them uh, obedient. Paul also contrasts God's writing on hearts rather than on stone tablets. And this contrast fits uh, the new covenant in Jesus that he mentions in which God would write laws on the heart. <clears throat> Paul was therefore confident in his ministry. It was God who made them competent, answering the question in 2.16. Uh, where the same term is translated sufficient, Paul develops the new covenant image uh, of 3.3, which implies moral transformation uh, 
Mere letters written with ink or in stone can bring only the law's death sentence for violations, but the spirit can inscribe believers' hearts so they can obey the law's principles. <coughs> Pardon my, uh, my cough. In 3, 7 through 11, Paul develops the logical premise that the new covenant's glory must be greater than the old covenant under Moses. Paul develops the point by repetition uh, and uh, also by uh, contrasting and arguments which go how much more uh, and all readily recognizable uh, to his contemporaries. New covenant glory, says Paul, unlike Moses's, was permanent and greater, but is the glory of the spirit within rather than without. Moses's revelation was incomplete because no one could see God and live. The new covenant glory is complete and does not kill. It is a ministry producing righteousness because the law is in the heart. So <clears throat> in 3.12 through 18, Paul contrasts the concealed, though visible nature of Moses's glory with the public, though inward nature of the new covenant glory. Um, in Exodus 33 and 34, uh, Moses uh, saw part of the Lord's glory. Perhaps in the new covenant experience, uh, the spirit uh, reveals even more. Just as Moses was transformed by seeing part of God's glory, so our participants in the new covenant transform progressively into God's glorious image as they behold God's glory. Perhaps the Corinthians question how much their characters have been transformed, but they could not question the character of Paul who had brought them the new covenant message. Uh, many Greek thinkers uh, believe that meditating on a deity's pure emotionalist character made, uh, made uh, that person like the deity. Many Jewish mystics uh, had sought visions of the divine. Paul is not interested in passionless divinity of Platonic philosophy. Rather, he believes that one meets God's glory in Jesus, God's purest image. Some Jewish thinkers conversant with Greek thought depicted divine wisdom as a mirror revealing God's glory. But for Paul, wisdom comes to us concretely in Jesus. Jesus is the wisdom of God in body. Now, starting in chapter four, <clears throat> despite opposition, Paul and his colleagues take courage as elsewhere in the context. Philosophers emphasized such courage, but in contrast to them, the reason Paul offers his courage is God's grace involved in his new covenant ministry. His open presentation of truth contrasts with Moses's veil. His persistent denial of falsifying God's message may contrast with his opponents. Just as a veil, Paul says, kept Israel from seeing God's glory, so now the good news was veiled from unbelievers. They could not see the gospel's glory because the God of this age had blinded them. Paul contrasts the situation uh, and, and with the God of this age uh, that has blinded unbelievers' minds, lest the light of Christ's glory shine in them. But the true God has shined the light of his glory into our hearts. In view of the contrast, uh, most think that the God of this age refers to the devil. Um, I would uh, take a little bit of a different view. I think it does refer to the devil, but I think it, also, uh, it, it refers to the devil. But it's important to note that Paul will then connect the God of this age, that's who is the devil, to the rulers of this age who are the earthly principalities, powers, the earthly emperors and kings who, who, whom the devil, the God of this age, is pulling their strings behind the scenes. Christ is God's image. Uh, many Jews thought of divine wisdom as God's image. Uh, for Paul, such titles rightly belong to Christ. God made light shine in darkness in the first creation and continues to do so in the new creation in Christ. Paul's wording alludes to the Greek version here, the Septuagint of Isaiah 9, which goes on to speak of the Messiah. Paul preaches himself, he, he says. He, pre he didn't preach himself, he preached Christ. Thus, he was ready to acknowledge his own weakness alongside Christ's glory. As Paul earlier emphasized, uh, apostolic suffering, 
uh, yet internal renewal by Christ uh, is there connected and integrated together. And he does the same things here. By the way, archaeologists observe that Corinth manufactured many cheap pots and such pots were easily discarded. And so maybe he, Paul makes a connection here when he talks about having the treasure in clay jars, having the treasure, having this treasure of the spirit of God and the wisdom of God in cheap clay. Uh, kind of a, con when we think of it in that respect, that's really, uh, uh, I think, a very uh, helpful contrast for us. Uh, Paul illustrates the contrast between his external weakness and the resurrection glory of Christ within him. Uh, Paul follows an ancient literary form that is that was used by philosophers and others to validate their in, va validate their integrity. The lists of sufferings, um, in other words, by going through these sufferings, it demonstrates their integrity and character and their commitment uh, to their cause. Now, such lists reveal Paul's perseverance, but Paul especially underlines here God's power revealed in his weakness. Uh, as a sharer in Christ's suffering, Paul also depends on resurrection power. He was being transformed into Christ's image. Following Jesus' example, Paul was to suffer on behalf of the church and ultimately for God's glory. Paul's allusion in 4.13 uh, to Psalm 116.10 may evoke the psalmist's context of a righteous sufferer whom God has delivered. Corinthians understood the ancient civic practice where benefactors contributed to the to contributed good to the public welfare in return receiving honor here god receives honor paul has future hope for god's servants here uh, starting in 416 paul is prepared to suffer in view of the resurrection life which was already at work within him paul's body suffered but god kept renewing him and this renewal constituted a foretaste of the ultimate resurrection, even of his body and that of others. Suffering for Christ, Paul is inwardly renewed. Uh, that is, he's conformed more to Christ's image. Paul's suffering invited eternal glory to which the suffering were barely, the sufferings were barely comparable. Uh, Greek thinkers often spoke of what was invisible and unchanging in the heavens as being eternal, in contrast to the visible transitory matters on the earth. Uh, here in 418, we see that Paul partly agrees with that because he, he already, although in a hidden way, shares in Christ's resurrection. Uh, eventually, his body will also share in the resurrection life. Uh, thus, Paul does not agree with the Greeks who viewed the body as merely the soul's prison or tomb, and we talked about that when we talked about 1 Corinthians 15. Nor does Paul believe with some Greeks that mediating on a divine entity in the heavens would liberate his soul from the body. Um, Paul was already united with Christ and now suffered with him so he could be assured of resurrection life affecting every aspect of his person. All right, that is it for today. We'll pick up tomorrow, beginning with 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for the hope that we have within us, the same hope that Paul had, that he shared with the Corinthians. And in his words that we read today, he shares that same hope with us. For that, we are thankful in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, friends, hasta mañana.